Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts, Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation, or DIC. In this video, I will be describing the causes and pathophysiology of DIC and reviewing the laboratory tests used in its diagnosis. But first, what is DIC? It's the abnormal activation of coagulation and fibrinolysis, usually triggered by the release of tissue factor or some other thromboplastic substances into the circulation, or by widespread endothelial damage. There are a variety of causes of DIC, some of which are shown here in this table from Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology. I'm going to focus on infections, neoplasms, and trauma. So infections uh, can cause DIC through either of the two uh, triggers described on, in the previous slide. So sepsis can cause widespread endothelial injury, and gram-negative uh, sepsis in particular can cause release of lipopolysaccharides into the circulation, so the procoagulant uh, stimulus. Meningococcemia is characterized by the release of tissue factor microparticles uh, into the circulation, leading to DIC. Neoplasms to consider are going to be uh, carcinomas, typically adenocarcinomas, so the GI tract or gynecologic tract, but also the lung. And these uh, malignancies can release tissue factor or a variety of other uh, factors referred to as cancer procoagulants. Another neoplasm uh, to consider uh, is acute promyelocytic leukemia. Uh, if you have a patient who has uh, this particular diagnosis, um, you have to be aware of the potential for DIC since the uh, promyelocytic blasts can release tissue factor into the circulation. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later. Massive tissue injury uh, is also a stimulus uh, for DIC. And when you think of trauma, you particularly want to consider brain trauma because of the potential release of fats and phospholipids into the circulation. Burns can also cause DIC through massive uh, endothelial injury. And don't forget that surgery is, in fact, a type of trauma to the body. So extensive uh, surgery is also a potential cause of DIC. Now, there are two main types of DIC, or two ways we conceive of this. One is acute or decompensated DIC, and the other is chronic or compensated DIC. Now, either of them can present with bleeding or thrombosis, but they have uh, typical presentations, as I'll describe in a moment. Now, acute DIC typically arises following trauma, sepsis, in the context of acute promyelocytic leukemia, or following an ABO-incompatible transfusion. Patients will typically present with uh, bleeding, and laboratory tests will show thrombocytopenia, so decreased platelets, prolonged PT, APTT, decreased fibrinogen, and increased D-dimers. By contrast, chronic DIC typically arises in the setting of a malignancy, so the adenocarcinomas that I mentioned earlier. And patients may, in fact, be asymptomatic, and you may only know that they have some sort of DIC going on because you notice an atypical laboratory test. However, they can also present with venous or arterial thromboembolism. Their laboratory tests will show mild to no thrombocytopenia and normal or slightly elevated PT, APTT, and fibrinogen with increased D-dimers. So the uh, unifying uh, factor here will be increased D-dimers. And we're going to go through each of these lab tests individually. I'm going to focus now on the pathogenesis of acute DIC. So as I mentioned, we have release of some procoagulant uh, into, the, into the circulation. And this is going to result in widespread fibrin deposition in the microvasculature. Downstream of this, we'll get ischemia. But one of the uh, consequences of this widespread fibrin deposition is that we're going to form a fibrin mesh. And as red blood cells try to squeeze through that mesh, they can be shattered into schistocytes, uh, which is going to result in a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Now, as you're forming all these clots, you're going to get depletion of platelets and clotting factors. Now, as you recall from key concepts videos, hemostasis one and two, when you begin forming clots, the body, in order to maintain hemostasis, is going to be uh, then looking at anticoagulation. So it will begin the release of plasminogen activators. So this combination, depleting your platelets and clotting factors and releasing these anticoagulant factors is going to drive you towards bleeding, which is why patients with acute DIC tend to present uh, this way. Now, this is what we see uh, on the slide when we're thinking about acute DIC. Uh, here you can see a beautiful glomerulus from uh, Elsevier's Expert Path. 
And in this uh, capillary, instead of there being uh, discrete uh, happy red blood cells, we see this uh, amorphous pink goo. Uh, and this is uh, fibrin, uh, and these are all fibrin microthrombi here in the capillaries. Now, as I mentioned, red blood cells try to push their way through this, tearing little bits off. These are called schistocytes, and these are what we'll see on the peripheral smear. Now let's focus here uh, on the uh, pathophysiology of acute DIC using this cartoon by Dr. Abhishek Das. As I mentioned, there are a variety of different causes. So we can have massive tissue injury, which is going to result in uh, circulating procoagulants, such as tissue factor. We have the potential of release of uh, procoagulants from tumor cells. So this is going to uh, contribute here. Now, in the case of sepsis, here we have some bacteria in the bloodstream. Monocytes are going to respond to that by elaborating the mediators interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor, which are going to cause endothelial dysfunction. In the case of widespread endothelial injury, such as in burns, we're going to get circulating procoagulants. And this endothelial injury is also going to cause platelet aggregation. And these circulating procoagulants and platelet aggregation are going to bring us down to widespread microvascular thrombosis, which is really nicely depicted here in this vessel, where you can see these tiny thrombi clinging to the walls. Now, as these thrombi are formed, they're going to uh, use up the building blocks of thrombi. So we're going to be consuming our clotting factors and our platelets. So this is what is referred to as a consumptive coagulopathy. This is going to drive us towards bleeding. Now, these little thrombi, as they form, are going to cause vascular occlusion, leading to uh, ischemic tissue damage. And as they clog up the vessels, we're going to have uh, this microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So here you see this uh, lovely little red blood cell shoving its way through the scylla and charybdis of these thrombi, yielding schistocytes. Now, once more, thinking about hemostasis, as these thrombi are forming, the body is going to begin activating anticoagulant mechanisms. So we have the activation of plasmin, which is going to begin fibrinolysis. This is going to yield, yield fibrin split products, which we will see uh, in our laboratory test review. And also, this, uh, this arm of fibrinolysis is going to inhibit thrombin, platelet aggregation, and fibrin polymerization. All of these are procoagulant, they're being inhibited, that's therefore driving us towards bleeding. Plasmin as well is going to act to, uh, on proteolysis of clotting factors as it uh, attempts to maintain hemostasis, once more taking us towards bleeding. So that's the pathogenesis of acute DIC. Let's focus for a moment on chronic DIC because why do we see uh, thrombosis instead of bleeding in chronic DIC? Now, if you think about acute DIC, so for example, in an amniotic fluid embolism, you have the release of this procoagulant factor into the blood, uh, but then it stops. With chronic DIC, you have a tumor which is releasing these procoagulant factors, and it doesn't stop. It's continually feeding this loop. So although you do have consumption, you have continued production, and this can drive you towards thrombosis. But once more, you can see um, bleeding in chronic DIC. So how will your patient present? Well, it depends on whether the predominant factor is going to be bleeding or thrombosis. So if bleeding is the, the primary uh, process that's going on, your patient will present with ecchymoses and petechiae and may have oozing of blood from surgical sites, venipuncture, and mucosal surfaces. So if you notice that uh, a patient uh, post-op has got oozing from the surgical site or there's some bleeding from the uh, IV site, you need to uh, think about the possibility of DIC. Now, thrombosis um, is typically going to present with venous thromboembolism, so deep venous thrombosis uh, or pulmonary embolism, or you can arterial thrombosis with infarct and ischemia. Now, two things that we see in the setting of uh, malignancies are going to be non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, also known as Libman Sachs endocarditis, uh, which are sterile vegetations that form on the heart valves. And those sterile, because they disrupt uh, laminar flow and because they can form a nidus for bacterial uh, colonization, they can lead to infective endocarditis. Another possibility is superficial migratory thrombophlebitis, also known as Trousseau syndrome. So for example, a patient may present uh, with thrombophlebitis of the left arm, which will then resolve, followed by thrombophlebitis of the right leg. Uh, and this is uh, the in chronic DIC, and so it's uh, happening as these tumors are elaborating these procoagulant factors.
So why are we so concerned about DIC? Well, you can get widespread organ dysfunction and multi-organ failure. So about 25 to 40 percent of patients with acute DIC will present with acute kidney injury. Liver dysfunction may manifest as jaundice, and you can see pulmonary hemorrhage, hemoptysis, and dyspnea when you have acute lung injury, and these patients will need respiratory support. Neurologic dysfunction can result in coma or delirium, and then in the, particularly in the setting of a meningococcemia, you can get adrenal failure or waterhouse friedrich syndrome secondary to hemorrhage and infarction of the adrenal glands. So if you're thinking that your patient may have DIC, which laboratory tests should you uh, use to make the diagnosis? Uh, this is um, uh, something new that we've brought into Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology, where for each chapter we have a table of laboratory tests along with the relevant pathophysiology uh, and clinical relevance uh, to help you put it all into context. Now, as you may be aware, uh, reference laboratory values vary depending on the population that's being sampled, so we're using the Mayo Clinic laboratory values uh, in this table and in the textbook. So if you have a patient who has a bleeding diathesis or a coagulopathy, you'll typically be ordering both an APTT and a PT, because between the two of them, you're going to be able to assess the intrinsic, common, and extrinsic pathways. Now, both of these tests involve using the patient's plasma and looking to see how long it takes for a clot to form. So in patients with DIC, since their plasma is depleted of clotting factors, you will tend to see a prolongation of PT and APTT. Another test that you uh, will probably order if you're suspicious for DIC will be D-dimers, uh, and this comes from the patient's plasma. Now, as you'll recall, D-dimers are a proteolytic byproduct of plasmin-mediated degradation of fibrin. So we tend to see this elevated in the context of DIC. Now, you won't be ordering just a platelet count. You typically will do a full CBC. And because once more of this consumption, you're going to see decreases in the number of platelets. Uh, you'll want to do a peripheral smear. We don't actually have a reference value for this. Uh, what we do is we put a drop of blood on a slide, and either a pathologist or a technician will review that uh, and look to see uh, if we have schistocytes, which will be indicative of microangiopathic uh, hemolysis. And finally, you may order a, uh, a fibrinogen. Uh, because, uh, as you recall, fibrinogen is important in the uh, clotting cascade, uh, and so you will tend to see uh, this being uh, consumed uh, if you have uh, clotting going on. But one thing you need to remember is that uh, fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant made by the liver. So in the case of chronic DIC, where you have this constant uh, inflammatory background, this is why you may have normal or elevated level levels of fibrinogen in chronic DIC. So I'm a pathologist. I don't talk a lot about treatment, but I need to close the circle for you. So for DIC, the most important thing is to correct the underlying problem, uh, because once you do that, that can help uh, DIC to resolve. You also want to provide support, so uh, volume uh, for patients who have an ABO uh, incompatibility uh, transfusion, uh, respiratory support, and if a patient uh, is bleeding, uh, then you'll be considering platelets uh, and or uh, fresh uh, frozen uh, plasma to provide clotting factors. If they have thrombosis, you'll be thinking about anticoagulation. Now, just to finish up, here are a few questions to test um, how uh, much you've learned in this short video. So which lab test should you order if you're considering DIC? Why are schistocytes seen in DIC, and how does that relate to the pathophysiology? And why does acute DIC often present with bleeding? So thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you found this uh, useful. Please put comments down below. I do find them helpful as I construct my videos.